Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about a potential evidence for a very unusual type of a supernova known as magnetorotational hypernova, something that's about 10 times more powerful than a regular supernova and something that the scientists believe produces a lot of different heavy elements in the universe. But this particular supernova, if it did happen, most likely happened billions and billions of years ago. So how exactly are the scientists so certain that this is what happened here? Well, it's actually based on a star they discovered not so long ago. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail because this is a pretty interesting story. But first of all, well, let's briefly discuss the types of supernova out there. What you just saw is known as the type 2 supernova. That's basically when a massive star suddenly collapses and explodes, producing a lot of energy. These are pretty common around the universe and we've discovered a lot of different subtypes of type 2 supernova as well. The other famous type of a supernova is known as the type 1 supernova and that's when a white dwarf, which is basically what our sun is going to become in the future, reaches a certain mass and cannot really hold itself together anymore and explodes producing an extremely bright explosion that generally has the same brightness. And because of this type 1 supernova are usually used in measuring distances. Not so long ago, the scientists have also identified the first ever type 3 supernova. I've briefly discussed this on the channel and you can check out the video that should be popping up somewhere right there at some point. And these three types of supernova and their subtypes are what essentially produces most of the non-hydrogen and non-helium elements in the universe. Because everything that's heavier than hydrogen and helium has to undergo a very very powerful reaction before it can become some other element, things like calcium, things like iron and so on and even heavier elements like plutonium, uranium and so on. But for these heavier elements like plutonium, uranium, it's kind of impossible or very very difficult for a regular supernova to produce amounts that we're observing in the universe. There's just not enough energy to produce these elements. And so over the years the scientists realized that another type of a supernova is probably responsible for all of this. This is what we refer to as the kilonova. And this only happens when two neutron stars collide with one another. This was further identified and also proven when the actual neutron star collisions were detected and when the light from them made it to planet Earth and the scientists were able to observe the actual emissions that suggested that there were things like gold and platinum in those emissions. Which of course implies that heavier elements, the heaviest elements in the universe, are very likely produced by these kilonova when two neutron stars collide. And so generally everything that's heavier on the periodic table than zinc is produced in this. It's not really produced in regular supernova. At least that's what the scientists believed for a very long time. But then something unusual happened and they found this very strange star. A star known as SMSS J2003-1142, located in the Milky Way's halo. And the first unusual thing about this star is that it's actually really ancient. It's what's known as the ultra metal poor star. A star that generally contains only hydrogen and helium, but also seems to contain some other elements but not to the same extent as our own sun. These stars are also sometimes known as UMP and we've found quite a few of them, a few dozen of them, and generally all of them are over 13 billion years old. Basically they were produced when the universe was really really young and the galaxy was still developing. Back then there weren't really that many heavy elements, we actually don't expect to find that many heavy elements in that period. And that's of course mostly because this is still the beginning of the universe and most things are still hydrogen and helium. Moreover, back then it's very likely that neutron star collisions were not really that prominent. As a matter of fact, they might have not even began yet. It does take quite a while for two neutron stars to approach each other before they can collide. And so we don't really expect to find, for example, gold or platinum in these early regions of the universe. And so when the scientists were looking at this particular star and they realized that it had a very high abundance of certain elements, for example elements like europium and thorium that are actually heavy elements, the scientists realized something is definitely different about this particular star. As a matter of fact, it seemed to have an unusually high amount of things like europium and uranium and a lot of other elements with very high atomic numbers. Yet overall it was still a lot less metallic than some of the other stars. Its metallicity is about 3000 times lower than our own sun. But proportionally it does have a lot more heavier elements. With also unusually high concentrations of nitrogen and zinc which are normally produced in highly magnetic environments. And this implied that the molecular cloud and the supernova from which this star was made 
was actually very different from anything we've seen before, and was most likely a very different supernova to begin with. It could not have been a supernova from two neutron stars, or a kilonova as it's known. It had to be something different, simply based on the actual concentrations involved here. And also, of course, based on the fact that this was way too early in the existence of the universe. And after doing the analysis, the only explanation that kind of made sense is this hypothetical supernova that's known as Magnetorotational Hypernova. You can actually find two of the simulations that I'm using here to watch this by yourself, because these supernova are generally very different from anything else we've ever studied. As you can probably tell from the name, it involves an object that's extremely high in magnetism, but it's also an object that's spinning really fast. That's why it's called magnetorotational. But because it's a hypernova, and not just a supernova, it means that the power it produces is generally much higher, at least 10 times higher than a typical supernova. And the way that the scientists believe all of this works is, well, it starts with a relatively massive star, probably at least 25 masses of the sun. This particular star is also spinning pretty fast, and as a result also has a relatively high magnetic field. But then, as it starts shrinking and condensing, as most of these large stars do, and basically as the core starts to collapse, its rotation and its spin also starts to increase. Which, as a result, produces something that sort of resembles this. This is what the scientists refer to as the proto-neutron star. It's not a neutron star, it's actually much larger than a neutron star, but it might become one if the object collapses completely. And generally there are going to be two different layers. One is going to be this proto-neutron star spinning really fast on the inside, and the other one is going to be the envelope that's going to be also spinning as well. And all of this obviously produces tremendous amounts of magnetosphere, with the overall magnetic energy of this object increasing over time. At some point though, the star reaches what's known as the magnetorotational instability. This is where there's a sudden acceleration and the growth of the star itself, which also causes a sudden growth in the magnetic field as well. Basically, the star suddenly starts to become really unstable and there's a tremendous amount of magnetic force involved. And then at some point, the magnetic pressure becomes very comparable with the gas pressure. And this is when, somewhere right here around the proto-neutron star, about 10 to 15 kilometers away from the center, a sudden compression wave starts to push everything to the outside, and basically moves through the entire envelope of the collapsed iron core, resulting in an extremely powerful explosion which also starts to saturate all of these elements with a lot of neutrons which then produce heavier elements. Which then of course produces the powerful supernova that we can technically see from really far away. But we've never really seen these in real life, and we don't really know of any progenitor stars that could produce one. So basically these are extremely rare events and most likely were very common back in the days, but we don't really know if they're still possible today. But at the moment, this type of supernova from a single star could pretty much explain exactly what happened to this star discovered back in 2016. For example, high levels of nitrogen in this star definitely suggest that the parent star was rapidly rotating because that's what we usually detect in this particular supernova. Yet the presence of zinc in this star also suggests that the supernova was at least 10 times more powerful than a regular type 2 supernova. And also generally speaking, the presence of these heavy elements so early in the universe would also be extremely difficult to explain if it wasn't for this magnetorotational hypernova. And so even though it's technically possible to explain this particular star by using several supernova and possibly several other events altogether, a much more likely explanation is a single event, with the single event being magnetorotational hypernova of a star about 25 masses of the Sun, which probably was one of the first stars in the universe, something we refer to as the population 3 stars, the stars that we've never actually seen before, and we don't even know what kind of supernova they produced back then. But it looks like, according to the discovery from this particular paper, at least one of these supernova was a mysterious one that we've never really seen before, and might never even see one again, simply because of the rarity of these particular events. And so I guess for now that's kind of all we know. Check out the paper and all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. Either way, stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.